welcome to this session on uh, the role of academies of science and art in the multilateral system. Uh, I have the pleasure to uh, moderate this session with Peter. Uh, he is already here. We should wait maybe a bit still. We are seven uh, speakers. And uh, I think uh, we should wait. Uh, oh, uh, we have uh, uh, arranged with Peter uh, the organization of this session. So we will give a short introduction, Peter and me, for a few minutes. And then we go into the uh, presentations. So I think we should start. Uh, with the introduction, I give you uh, in a few minutes uh, a short introduction. The starting point is that uh, politics has lost so much in trust. And academia has uh, gained in importance uh, also in the public. Uh, the scientification of the society uh, needs to have evidence based uh, uh, politics and. Uh, we should uh, closing the door to the fake news, uh, news uh, which were uh, in the last few years uh, coming up. Academia consists not only of uh, uh, the academics, uh, but also of university and business. For example, universities have in their budget about 40% for research. It's uh, much more than uh, the sum of all uh, academies. Uh, at the same time, business has uh, also very uh, uh, great capacity for research, especially for applied research. So academies have, uh, if we take out the academies, academies have uh, created uh, an international network of networks, and Peter will uh, 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 talk about. And uh, the main characteristics from the view from the World Academy is that they are uh, restrained in their access uh, to advices for politics and implementation. And the second uh, is uh, they are primarily discipline oriented uh, in contrast to the uh, World Academy. So the trust <coughs> of uh, <coughs> the multiple uh, political system uh, altogether will result uh, from uh, a strong integration of the global networks of academies and research institutes. They will help uh, if we want to say this, uh, to empower politics uh, by the integration of uh, the networks of the academy. Integrating politics uh, and uh, academies needs a turn to action. And this more precisely means interdisciplinary work and implementation. So the existing network global networks of uh, academies have uh, to turn much more to interdisciplinarity and to implementation that they do now. The implementation rests on the participation of all concerned stakeholders, which include business, politics, uh, NGOs, uh, youth, and gender, and so on. So, Every uh, societal group have to be uh, integrated uh, in the uh, development of the global networks of uh, uh, research uh, institutes and uh, academies. A cornerstone in this is the SDG implementation, which uh, integrates the uh, the academy and research institute in the multilateral system. So it's a catalytic device 
uh, and uh, uh, I the, uh, the the integration uh, uh, of all sciences uh, is necessary for the implementation of the SDGs. So an effective integration need the cooperation and a mission oriented network between the academies, which may be platforms, for example, for artificial intelligence, medicine and things like this, a global infrastructure, we know that, for example, Africa is not uh, sufficiently to the uh, internet. It needs open informational changes. And what is a difficult question is intellectual property rights regulation, which is lacking now and which is needed, for example, in the pandemic uh, uh, crisis now. Uh, science diplomacy. Uh, has an important role to play for developing an effective integration of academies and politics. We have in on Friday a session uh, on uh, the activities in Geneva concerning this integration uh, of science diplomacy for the development, the further development of uh, the uh, academy. Uh, referring to VAS, <clears throat> it has a unique role in the uh, concert of uh, uh, the uh, global academies, uh, has the special characteristic of interdisciplinarity and implementation orientation. And VAS could be a catalytic leadership within the global networks of the academies. So, the cooperation should uh, go through well-targeted organizational cooperation. For example, uh, memorandum, memorandum of Understanding uh, and mission-oriented oriented, uh, common projects. So it has been a very uh, operational dimension. Uh, uh, in the cooperation between existing global uh, networks of academies and the World Academy. Integrating scientific capacity uh, in all uh, networks of the academies <clears throat> and political decision would accelerate the evolution of the human centered politics, which is lacking now and not existing. And finally, to a human centered global society. So, in this framework, uh, we will certainly discuss many things. And I would ask now Peter to give an introduction uh, from his perspective of the EIAP. Please. Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, <clears throat> Um, well, first, let me mention, um, you know, we're talking here about the role of academies in, in multilateralism, um, which very much begs the question of how academies are engaging both nationally in, in their own countries and sort of regionally and internationally, um, particularly with, with the U UN system or perhaps the, for like the regional economic commissions, the RECs of the UN system and, and so on. Um, and of course, we have WAS as a, as a global academy and, and two other global academies that I can think of. The World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, which is based in Trieste here, where, where I am, and is the host academy of IAP. And also the, the Global Young Academy, and we're, we're grateful for Almas to join us as well, representing the, the Global Young Academy. So we have three models, if you like, or each of them quite different, but all with a global focus of the uh, with academy status. Um, and then we have IAP itself, which is the, the global network of academies, academies of science, medicine and engineering. So we now have 143 members. So each of those um, global academies that I mentioned, WAS, TWAS, and the GYA are, are all members of IAP. 
We have a couple of regional members. The Caribbean Academy, for example, brings a number of sort of Caribbean islands together. Um, we have an Arab World Academy, for example, in, in the Middle East based in Jordan. Um, the African Academy of Sciences, of course, is, is growing increasingly influential in Africa. Um, but we also have very many national academies, and I'm, I'm sure most of our speakers today are also not only members of WAS, but also members of their, their national academies. Um, and within IAP, we tend to group those together into four regional networks, um, ESAC for Europe, NASAC for Africa, then we have ASA for the Asia Pacific region, and YANAS, the Inter-American network of academies of science for North and South America. Um, so I'm together under the banner of IAP, we try to do exactly what we've been talking about here, or what Eric mentioned, sort of providing policy advice, science advice, science recommendations based on the best available science on emerging issues, artificial intelligence, um, genome technologies, whatever it might be, um, to, to national governments, to regional and to international governments. Um, but I, I think some of the questions that I, I would like to throw towards our panelists, but we're going to give our panelists um, time, time to speak on, on their own, of course, is are, are academies equipped to do this? Do they have the, the capacity, the abilities to really engage nationally and regionally with these policy making bodies? Um, if not, what would be required? What can we do to assist them? Um, and then again, how can we arrange ourselves better, perhaps to build our synergies between global academies, between regional networks of academies and so on, so that we're, we're more co coherent in the, the voices that we do raise and the messages that we try to present. So I, I will leave those questions on the table and I think pass over to our, our first panelist. I'm looking at the, the agenda as it is online and I see Marcel van der Boord. Um, Marcel is professor at the University of Technology of Delft and a trustee of WAS. So Marcel, if you have a, any comments, I think with Eric, we decided we could have five minutes each. So please keep your any remarks to within five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Do you understand me? You hear me? Yes. It's fine. In any case, good afternoon, everybody. I must say that already two excellent introductions have been given. The first one on philosophy and the second one about the, uh, uh, all the uh, academies who are existing. I would like just to make also a few points. Number one is now 60, 60 years ago, one launched this academy, the World Academy. Uh, uh, and if I look a little bit to the origins, I think that must have been very clever people. And I think one can continue the same line. And I thought that these people, their mandate was more or less international to serve the world via international organizations. And I think that is the right way that we could continue. That's my feeling. But I have also a very important point. I have, uh, I personally, a member of some academies, like in Paris, a well-known ac academy, the Royal Society, an American academy, and member of a Japanese and a Chinese by correspondence. Now, in all of the academies, or the majority of the academies with which I am concerned, that is mainly on sciences or medicine or technology. And these academies are called science and art. But at the end, the art is not so important. And I think what has already been mentioned before, that is so-called the multidisciplinarity or the transdisciplinarity is so important. 
that in future we should have both the both academies together. And I think the so-called WAS today is more or less an academy for natural sciences and human sciences. And I think this is a very important uh, element. The second point what I wanted to make is that uh, yeah, there are many, many, many academies. And the point is, where is in future the right place for VAS between the massive number of academies? We should put order. I think that also Peter was hinting to that one, but that is a very important uh, the topic which I feel. What is the place and what is also the task? What should be given in future? What is the mandate of the World Academy? If you look a little bit about the activities of some academies, if I take in France of the Royal Society as an example, they have as tasks, number one, they are very successful with their foresight studies. Foresight studies or topics which they feel are extremely important for their country, but even also outside the country for important topics. And they are really followed, the foresight studies, by scientists, engineers, medical people, but even in societies with a high reputation, even by the population, what the society says that is followed. A certain a duty what they have particularly, that is the government or industry or other bodies ask the academy to execute specific studies, studies on topics which are important of the country. Now recently, about all the so-called COVID exercises, some excellent studies have also been made. And what these people say, like the academy in France, in Paris, people are really following these guidelines. And even also government follow the guidelines of academies. Academies get a mandate, they do their job, get a lot of money for it, and finally, they, uh, these studies are normally highly reputed. These people can also get other mandates, like at the European Union, we gave recently a study, or recently, now six months ago, to the Royal Society and also to the French Academy for the evaluation of the 21-27 European program. They get, they are making excellent studies on the basis of what is needed. And secondly, they got also a lot of propaganda they can make with the excellent studies they are making. Now, what is in the case of was should we follow that one? What should be the mandate of uh, was into the future? I think what we should not do is a kind of a, a duplication. That means what is being done nationally in various countries, I wonder if we should really tackle these topics. Should we go on a higher level? like you have the various countries in the continent of Africa, they are working quite nicely together. Should we really go on that level? Or should we go on a world level that is the international? And I think that is the place where we should be. But I really leave that point as a discussion point on the table. It would be very nicely to see what are the various tasks to be done. I think it should be done tasks which are very important for the international world or, and in addition to that, not well known, nobody else is doing these topics. 
I give a kind of an example. If you look about the education, which is quite an important element, the education nationally leaves it to national people, leave it on a higher level to these bodies. But on a world basis, I think that is a kind of an open door. It would be very useful to have an educational system worldwide between China, Japan, US, Europe, and other countries. And I think that could be an example for us, like there might be many other examples, but it should be something what is very important, what is not existing yet there, and others are not working on it. So the separation of tasks, what also was mentioned by Peter in an indirect way, is a very important kind of a topic. And then a world academy or world academies, as there are no various, what should be their task with respect to links, linkages? That means contacts with other kind of academies. How should that be? In principle, it is very important that a, a world academy should know what is going on in all the various kinds of academies. They should get an input so that they really can form their proper decisions of advices or recommendations. So there should be some links, uh, how and which links do we have to make in future? I really would not like to make statements I don't have the time for it, but I really would like and put this kind of question. Another point is, what should be the, not the linkage, but the collaboration between the various academies? How should they operate? And how should they be integrated one in the other? And there are so many. Uh, what is the appropriate task? And what is the appropriate mechanism? in order to do that. And for an, an organization at OAS, I don't like to come back on the topics which have already been mentioned. How can we organize and how can we do it, etc. What is the job? But more or less in the way of who could we make ourselves excellent? As in principle, academics must be excellent. One really sees on a national basis but in addition to that one, one really sees, for example, the Royal Society that is a well prestigious body in the United Kingdom, what they publish, everybody is using, not only in the United Kingdom, but also outside. And the same thing in France, but also that in the United States that is really used practically worldwide. Now, how could we make was also a body of excellence, which is really top level that everybody is listening to us, that governments are really listening to us and governments are really keen to give studies to us so that us can get a kind of uh, reputation. How can we realize that with us? We are not really yet there, but I think it would be very important to do that. Now I see there are a number of open questions. If I look a little bit about an entrance in the uh, Royal Society, I think it is not very easy to become a member. And I can tell you, it was extremely difficult to become a member in the French Academy. That is only one or two a year or even less. But the people there, they are quite of very high standard. What should be the standard of VAS and in which way should we go? If you have a high level, what well, principally, on a world basis, what is needed? It is already so difficult for the various countries and the various international organizations and take also the United Nations. How difficult is it in order to get a law, a proof of a guideline accepted? So if was had to be advised, it should be really on very high level. And do they have the people available in order to do all those kind of jobs? 
that is just a kind of questions which one can ask. What do one want in future after 60 years with was In which way do we want to go? What is the right way? What are the great topics and what should be done? And in respect to the people who are sitting in was or that the people leave, we want, or do we still need many additional people? And in that respect, I think that it would be very important if we are worldwide, that we also have a very strong representation from China, from Japan, from other countries, even also from Africa. But I really see Africa and some other underdeveloped countries different from developed countries. And I think one should have taken two approaches, one for the developed, because the underdeveloped cannot fall. But the underdeveloped should be put, not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, also on the same level. We cannot treat them as slaves. This time is over. So which way should we go for once in order to get the world? closely linked in us, and that we really can talk about topics on a world type basis. I could go on, uh, your Chairman, by putting a number of, of questions uh, here on the table, but I think I uh, would like to stop so that we still have a little bit of time into the second round or that we have a discussion afterwards in order to bring the various ideas together and that we can get a kind of distillation of what we uh, will do during this afternoon session. Thank you very much. Okay, Th thank you, Marcel. On to the next speaker. So thank you for those very, very interesting, incisive remarks. And, and again, a few questions that we can come back to in the discussion. Um, the next I see on the, the agenda is Iori Engelbrecht, from former president of the Estonian Academy of Sciences and also a trustee of WAS. So Iori, please, can you try and keep to, to five minutes, please? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to tell a little bit about the general ideas of the, the academies and uh, these seem to be important for, for the most for the future, and, and then I try to be rather brief and, and then come to the final message uh, at the very end. So, as we all know, the contemporary academies emerged from the Renaissance period, so it's about 400 years ago, and now adopted all uh, over the globe. And what are the, the, the important uh, uh, points? Uh, Members are elected on the basis of their scholarly reputation. And then this is a symbiosis uh, in, in the academy, the dual part. The members acquire reputation through the membership and academies get reputation from their members. So they, they, they can't be separated. And, and the tasks of the academies is actually this, that's quite, we all know it's, it's a promote science and scholarship, it's, it's quite clear, but provides, provide also advice and expertise, which is more and more important um, nowadays. And in addition to promote scientific understanding, that means communication. These are the main tasks for, for contemporary academies, whether they are national academies or, uh, or world academies. And there are several values which are behind all this sort of, you know, actions and, 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 and the membership. It's a trust in science. So it means that, that there are evidence-based solutions. And the, the second, uh, important value is ethics. This is something that, for example, Alea has been um, uh, dealing uh, for, a, for a long time. And what is important now that the, usually the membership is from all the field of research, although in 
bigger countries, Iran, where, where academics for literature and academy, academics for medicine and all that. But nevertheless, the, 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 all fields of research in academy means that, that they are the best to analyze the complexity of world. And this is something that, that it is really important for, for, uh, for, the, for the research, for, for well, solving the problems, whatever we call them, sustainable development goals or, or, or the, the curiosity-based science and all that sort of thing. And now, uh, sometimes it is discussed that, that why, what is the difference? That, that why academics cannot take the, such kind of decisions like politicians uh, take? Academies actually follow the basic principles of scientific research. It, seem, it means that there are transparent uh, methodology, methodologies, scientific arguments based on facts, logical analysis, and the evidence-based results. But in policy, and these choices and visions are decided very often by voting and often using compromises. And that's not in science. We all know that, that this is the, the main problem that, that we have to really to defend. And then we, we, this, this is the characteristic to, to the academies. Now, the, uh, if, if we now go on, then for the World Academy, ours, is, has set up the, 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 the ideas to discuss objectively and scientifically the vital problems of mankind beyond all groups of interest and from a global uh, viewpoint. And this is something that is, is, is really very important, keeping the activities and discussions on the track of research. And this is the, the guarantee for the existence of the academies, whether they are national academies or uh, international academies. And then uh, if we now think about the, 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 the academia, well, including all the, the, the academic research in general, then I think that the best uh, this sort of short explanation is recently given by the International Science Council, ISC, uh, and this is to identify manageable pathways to global sustainability through the complex web of cause and effect connecting planetary, social and economic processes and to assist in the creation and promotion of policies and public actions that can move societies along them. This is a, a, a pretty well, clear statement. And, and actually, uh, that, there is something that, that I would like to, to end my, my short presentation, the, the final message. Uh, this is caught to my memory when I listened about 20 years ago, uh, Joseph Rothblatt, uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize awardee. This was at the conference in Warsaw, the anniversary of Marie Curie uh, held in Warsaw. And he said, knowledge means responsibility. And this is uh, something quite important. This is important for, for, for academics. This is important for the IFP. This is important to the ISC. Uh, knowledge means responsibility. And this is something that was also emphasized um, in the statement of Mars uh, in April um, this uh, uh, last year. Uh, it was about the planetary momentum. That was uh, how the, the Mars should, should actually understand uh, and, and what are the problems that the decision theory or or the, 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 the weaknesses of the social systems uh, and, and conventional thinking and the global crisis and, and, and so on. So that this is something that we have to deal and I, I'm virtually very pleased that, that, that this conference actually has uh, 
is going to touch uh, so many problems and I'm looking forward uh, again to the, 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 the last day when we, we try to understand that, that what, what has been, uh, been uh, discussed at all the, the sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I think we should uh, go further to Momia, please. Momia is the former uh, president of the Montenegrin uh, uh, Academy for Science and Arts. Thank you, thank you, Eric. I will try to fix all my saying in five minutes. And let me just start by saying that by multilateral cooperation, by definition, academies are supposed to facilitate collective actions such to help to prevent or many potentially long-term damages as well as many other issues. And that's what is multilateralism in, within academies. Over the past several decades, multilateralism has been taught to be the only acceptable solution to upgrading the global order. In a globalized interconnected modern world, often a solution for many problems cannot be reached with the help of research in only one discipline and only from one side. Such among many functions academies perform, the multilateralism has become very important. Multilateralism is the form of membership in international institutions and associations, which serves to uh, constrain powerful while discouraging unilateralism by giving to a relatively small academy chance to make their voice heard and their interests taken into account. It is also an opportunity for big academies to make their leadership more acceptable, less burdensome and less intrusive. Thus, the main proponents of multilateralism have been the academies from middle-sized countries, while big academies often tend to act unitarily. The term regional multilateralism has been proposed, suggesting that, uh, quote, uh, contemporary problems can be better solved at the regional rather than at the bilateral or global levels. The question is whether regional integration arrangements are good or bad for the multilateral system, knowing that every national issue has not only regional, but often equally a global dimension. In that process, multilateral negotiation can be blocked by any of the participants, what means that there is an inverse proportion between legitimacy and effectiveness. The benefits of multilateral cooperation among academy academies are access to expertise by sharing and transferring of knowledge, skills and techniques, formal division of labor, less isolation from researchers, increasing of the visibility of the work, while sharing capacities such as the financial cost, access to equipments and other resources. By practicing multilateralism, academy help in linking the global to the local by clarifying the connection between the immediate conditions researchers face and the global processes that are affecting them, as well as by linking local struggles with global support. Global problems require global solution, and the recent COVID-19 pandemic has shown how essential is to emphasize the urgency of multilateral cooperation among academies. To perform multilateralism, multilateralism, academies participate on a regional or world level in many forms, what was said earlier, of international cooperation such as in ISQ, IIP, ISEC, ISEC, and so on and so on. Too many. In fact, I read somewhere that in Europe, there are more than 50 different associations of academies, only in Europe. We know only for Ali, yes, I can solve. Today, the multilateralism is under tension. What, what comes from the evolving role of influence of the new actors, such as developing countries, the business community, academia and NGOs, and the increasing impact of the individual uh, and their ways of decision-making. What is new today is that some big national academies are trying to go it alone, more often by pulling out of the international agreements and leaving international organization. 
it is still too early to understand is this mean among academies that materialism is on the way. Certainly, it faces challenges due to renewed emphasis on state sovereignty, raising nationalism, calls for protector, protectionism, and the changing global balance of power in an increasingly multipolar world. Current issues such as the climate change, information communication technology, cybersecurity, and many more um, demands for multilateral, multilateral solutions, but also generate global divergences. The multilateralism should be the way to find solution when the uh, multilateral coalition is sufficiently representative, what is often case in the world of national academies. As a general rule, the multilateral and representative formats have no alternative when it comes to fundam fundamental systemic problems. In multilateral negotiation, mutual confidence between academies is more critical than in bilateral negotiation. Furthermore, multilateralism is obviously not the same as multipolarity, since multipolarity does not necessarily imply multilateralism. Last and the most important is in the contemporary world that the nature of today's problems leads us to treat the multilateralism as essential. In coming time, more than ever before, we in academies have to promote the notion of, of multilateralism for all. To conclude, multilateralism among academies should help in bringing together those who believe that such cooperation is needed in indispensable foundations of sec uh, secure peace, stability, and prosperity while understanding existing problems as well as those of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, um, I think uh, we should discuss later on the question of uh, institutional membership. Momer, you, uh, you have been uh, engaged in this discussion within the World Academy, but we will postpone it now. And I ask the next speaker to come at the floor. It's Professor of Economics in Belgrade, please. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, inspirative panel. Uh, in the spotlight in this panel, it seems to me, uh, is the backing of uh, policymakers and uh, uh, politicians uh, regarding the concept uh, World Academy of Art and Science uh, already developed. Uh, actually, uh, what we are talking about these days are uh, two things. Uh, the trends of tomorrow, having made uh, the future normal, and the role of science, hard and soft, uh, together in so-called the Great Reset and foundation of new system. Uh, structural crisis definitely is a starting point for making any projections today. Uh, this crisis is a consequence of economic theory fault lines and economic policies based on them. Having made unsustainable, not only economic system, but also uh, the planet Earth as a whole. So we are in conundrum. People not functioning in rationally designed and sustainable system, but rather in liquid modernity. In such context, future is behind us. Economic system full of structural imbalances and unconventional policies and related unintended solutions cannot recover and make the planet sustainable without the great reset. The COVID black swan is only widening the all structural imbalances, making, uh, making bad situation worse. 
The Great Reset doesn't mean changing everything we know. The Great Reset means changing what needs to be changed. The first in line from my perspective as a professor of economics for un uh, undergoing changes in the Great Reset is economic system change. Economics is a science of context based on nexus of social conventions. As the main med system, economic system is highly non-linear with frequent paradigm shifts. D due to such variability, economics is sometimes explained as the dismal science, the toil in the hand of politicians. Unlike what happens in nature, the internal rules based on which the economic system is created following the economic rules depend almost exclusively on human aspirations and power, and they are changeable. So lawmakers and policymakers mostly ignore that the laws that govern nature do not depend on economic schools standpoints or government visions. These laws are not negotiable. Uh, economics orthodoxies have introduced so-called pattern matching paradigm based on arbitrary proposition of so-called ceteris paribus in optimization modeling. Consequently, modeling in economics is very risky because autocorrelation. Also, the main fault line in economics is proposed linearity of economic system and efficient feedback of market. The fourth industrial revolution exacerbating dominance of non-linear systems everywhere. Consequently, in a new settings, holistic approach, try and errors, heuristics, feedback loops, dominate optimization modeling, typical for economic orthodoxies. Previous is particularly important when technical economic system are integrated, for example, in smart production. When universal connectivity is new free good, and when platforms are replacing industries and value chains as ecosystem of basic economic agents, economic system is going to be non-linear. So economics as a field, which pretends to be science in a new context, requires paradigm shift regarding the natural law and regarding characteristics of non-linear systems. Paradigm shift in economics means a new model of growth and related economic policy platform. Shift from the linear model of production to the regenerative and circular economy is imminent in all levels. Also new economic policy platforms accounts to institutional choice simultaneously. It is not against the market, but pro-government. It means that invisible hand of the market and visible hand of the state operate simultaneously. This is the reason why we named this platform in the World Academy heterodox. Previous components are embodied in, a, in emerging variant of the capitalism known as stake, stakeholders capitalism or progressive capitalism. After successful conceptualization inside WAAS and fertile networking, we are looking for leaders backing, backing of lawmakers and policymakers. My sense is that we must be proud about concept we developed. Chances for backing are great. I can only add two things which are in the spotlight of this day's panel we are participating. First, if humanity wants the great reset, multilateral approach in harmonization of raising expectations about the future, we want, as well as multidisciplinary approach in science are more convenient than a siloid approach with the clear demarcation lines between local and global and between natural sciences and social sciences respectively. From the planet Earth perspective, and strictly materially speaking, unconstrained and unregulated economic growth coordinated by invisible hand of the market is impossible. 
So mission statement of multilateral institution should be to restore circular and regenerative processes within global economy and within local ones. Second, I'm not fan of te technological determinism or any sort of deus ex machina, but I think that some coherence in science basics between hard and soft sciences, social and uh, uh, natural sciences is necessary condition enabling that science will be principal leverage of human prosperity in a future we want. When it comes to economics, the paradigm shift in economics should be compatible with natural laws, means circular processes and evolution and non-linear system functioning. I will stop here. Thank you for attention and I'm hearing the questions after that. Uh, later on, in relation to the, uh, the work that uh, the academies, you know, or for example, in the uh, academies, economics play an increasing role because it's so important in the society. Uh, but uh, it, it is traditional economics which is not linked to some progress or reform. Uh, those who are in the economic section of national economy, they are traditional economic economists, and they are not progressing as the majority of this. So the next speaker will be uh, Ibor Dot. He is a former Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I would like to make three points to make a case that um, indeed cooperation uh, between academies, between scientists is a strong requirement. Uh, number two, give two examples, two concrete examples about domains where this uh, network of networks should be deployed. And uh, number three, to point out why VAS has a niche and has all the advantages compared to others. So <clears throat> let me start with the, with the uh, cooperation, Co uh, corporate or, or uh, 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 disappear uh, notion. Number one, the Emergence of this academy, uh, in my judgment, is uh, traced back to what was Oppenheimer saying in July 1945. In July 1945, Oppenheimer was citing a Sanskrit uh, epos, uh, the uh, Bhagavad Gita. And he said, I am become death the destroyer of worlds. So these were the words of Oppenheimer. And um, I learned only later when I was running the organization on the nuclear test ban uh, treaty that while he was pronouncing uh, these poetic words, tears were running down his cheek. Tears were running run down his cheek when, when he was saying that. So when uh, Oppenheimer and other scientists initiated in 61 uh, the, the VAS, what probably was inspiring them, the Manhattan Project, from the point of view of thousands of scientists focusing to achieve one goal. At that time, it was the creation of, of the atomic bomb. In 1961, Oppenheimer meant something different, focusing some thousand or more scientists' mind as a laser and trying to create a big science advocacy because the Manhattan Project was the precursor of big science, a big science advocacy. The 
opportunities um, of big science turned in 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 the in in support of the international uh, system was where proven if we have a look at some of the entities which in a way materialize the concept cern is one of them the european uh, nuclear research center where with thousands of scientists the large hadron collider was created I would like to mention the, my own organization system. So uh, we deployed 10,000 scientists years to figure out scientifically how to provide verification for the nuclear test ban. Another example, another example is, and this is bringing us closer to today, is the International Panel on Climate Change. Again, each and every year, thousands of scientists in different domains and subdomains and sub subdomains are focusing like a laser beam to resolve the issues ahead of us on climate change. And in a way, the SDG uh, preparation and implementation was supported not as much, but uh, quite a number of scientific institutions. Where it is bringing us, my feeling is that while academies will exist for the next hundreds of years, the cutting edge will be this big science cooperation, targeted big science cooperation. And where we have to make a difference that the examples I mentioned be the CERN or the IPCC or the SDG, they were driven, driven by states. So these were state-driven um, uh, big science advocacy, scientific support undertakings. I would like to mention two areas where probably in a more proactive way, big scientific cooperation networks could prevail. One is described today more and more frequently as the ESG disclosures. E standing for environment, S standing for social, and G standing for governance, altogether they might, call, might be called sustainability disclosures. This is how big companies should provide their financial reporting along the standards developed. We are speaking as of now around 13 trillion, 13 trillion capitalization level of those companies who in a voluntary setting already reporting. I don't think that the presence of science, the presence of uh, academia is well, uh, understood at this stage. This is more or less a voluntary undertaking by the standard setting entities, financial reporting entities. It is extremely important because if it was in 2019, like hundreds of, of big companies reporting along the, the lines, the doubling potential is there. So this 13 trillion very quickly in a couple of years can encompass an annual GDP level of the world. The area is still very much uh, opaque. No one knows exactly which standards, uh, how to interpret sustainability, how to interpret the different elements. So it is a transdisciplinary area. The other area I would like to mention is something I will talk about tomorrow. My feeling is that as one of the futures, one of the scenarios, we might be approaching what I call a change of age. A change of age between uh, the third industrial revolution characterized era to the fourth industrial revolution. And change of age is not an easy voyage. Uh, the most recent change of age happened in between 1914 
1945. The previous one, end of the 18th century, first half of the uh, 19th century. There is a need to look into all the different aspects, how to manage this potential age of uh, combination of uh, disruptions, uprising, potential civil wars, wars and major wars, and the combination of all of them. Why was it uh, uh, their position to do that? Uh, number one, in academic fora and academies, it is a reputation risk to transgress into a new domain by those scientists who are there. In VAS, while we are basically academic, freedom of these horizontal transgressions is tolerated. And it's extremely important to think out of the box because we are facing situations which are happening each four or five generations potentially. Number two, in the academies, real convergence science is still a rarity. In VAS, in VAS we have an interdisciplinary melting pot without overstating the, the, the point. In a number of defining academies, social sciences are underrated or excluded from funding. And this is a, still a recent phenomenon in very defining ac academies. Uh, in, in vast social scientists are well represented, I should say, even uh, sometimes overrepresented, too, too well represented. Then governments are more directly influencing academies in their core activities and core domains. Like one example is climate change. And I hope we will retain what we have, the independence of VAS independence from governments, independence from organizations, independence from ideology. And the last point that with the potential, with potential dark clouds uh, on the horizon, in case we will have to go this uh, change of age, there is a risk that the, what I call the Solvay conference phenomenon might happen. And the Solvay conference phenomenon is the following. In between World War I and World War II, in between 1911 and 1948, uh, Solvay conference had 37 years of existence, out of which the Solvay conference, bringing together the best brains on earth, uh, nearly 20 Nobel Prize winners in one meeting, they were in coma they did not meet because of the change of age going on at that time. So I hope we will not be paralyzed. I hope we will do in those two domains I mentioned, what are the niche areas for us and for the reasons why tears were running down the cheeks of Robert Oppenheimer. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. We have now the last speaker. Uh, it's our uh, lady here. And afterwards, we uh, uh, touch on the uh, questions. Uh, Peter has uh, elaborated before this session. So it's your. Thank you very much, Eric, and uh, Peter uh, as well for inviting me to this prestigious event. So uh, anyways, it was really great to listen to all of the uh, wonderful speeches by the senior members. And uh, I would say that the reason that Peter approached Global Link Academy, um, it was really an honor for us to accept that invitation. And we believe that through connections between prestigious senior national science academies and uh, national academies, this can lead to a better approach to exert national leadership in advancing science through projects that the scientist community themselves determine as priority areas. So better communication interactions between different generations of scientists, I personally believe as well, that they can often be more effective to lead better interactions at later stage with science, society, or even with the politicians as well. 
and then they also bring new energy to these interactions with the advances that women scientists they have made in the recent decades. So um, if I talk a bit about the background, why, uh, I mean, and how GYA came into existence, who GYA is. So uh, the GYA grew out of the discussions among top young scientists and researchers that uh, sit together uh, during World Economic Forum in 2008 and 2009. And officially uh, it was founded in February 2010 with support of the IAP. And uh, in 2019, we became the full member of, I mean, GYA became the full member of the IAP. We were so happy for that. So with support from the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, the Berlin uh, Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and the German Young Academy, the GYA received startup funding um, to have, you know, to establish this great uh, organization for the uh, young researchers. And what GYA is, GYA gives a voice to young scientists around the world to realize their vision. Um, we develop, connect, and mobilize young talent from six continents. Moreover, we empower young researchers to lead international, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational dialogue with the goal to make global decision-making evidence-based and inclusive. So uh, our executive committee members membership is really diverse. We have people from Bangladesh, from Germany, from UK, from Japan, from Brazil, and also uh, GYA is supported by an advisory board composed of outstanding senior scientists and science managers. We have currently 200 members. Um, typically, you know, they are uh, being taken, you know, after three to ten years after their PhD between 30 to 40 years of age. And um, um, we have more uh, around 300 alumni as well from different countries. And what we do, uh, we focus on science and policy, the science environment and science education and outreach, as well as cross-cutting theme like GYA and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So currently we have uh, many projects running. Um, we have many working groups, the ideas they are given by uh, young researchers and they are the ones who take the lead um, for working working out, you know, making things happen there from the world. And I think uh, uh, that my time is running short and I am going to, uh, I will stop here, but something that was really interesting said by, uh, has the economics, a background from economics, that the economic system is non-linear. I really like that. Um, I personally have a family member who is from economics background. And when I talk about, you know, big ideas and, and I take those ideas to him, always, you know, the approach is different. So I really believe that scientific system need the multi- uh, lateral approaches. We need inclusion of not just the scientists, but also uh, politicians, you know, people from the business areas, because if we are not going to develop that common language that is understandable between different players, it will be very difficult to, uh, you know, find solutions for sustainability on the global level. So thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we can open the floor now uh, for discussion among the panelists shortly. Uh, and afterwards, I would ask uh, Peter to advance certain questions he has elaborated, uh, mainly concerning the cooperation between IAP uh, and was, uh, but for the first time it's uh, Mobia. Thank you, Eric. Very interesting discussion. But before I say something, I want to point that the topic is academy, not academia. So yeah. some people were talking on academia. That's yeah. completely, I would not say completely different issue but it is a different issue. The title is academies, 
national and other academies in their role. So that is, we have to recognize that's IIP, not XQ as a only institution that deals with academies. So that's mm -hmm. my first point. We have to concentrate on the title. I don't have anything against academia, but this is a topic, academies. And that's the first um, I want to say. The another thing is, what is the really multilateralism? Is this, by definition, this is a three parties uh, arrangement. But is this uh, individual or institutional? I would say in my experience, which is not long, which is very long, and I would say is uh, with many institutions around the world, that is uh, among institutions, not among individuals. Even if it starts with individuals, it ends with institutions. And that's what we have to recognize. That's what we have to recognize. As far as, far as my knowledge goes, that's been always among institutions. And if it's among institutions, then in case when it's among national academies and other parties, then it is between states. That's between governments. So that's what we have to consider. As simple as that. We say my academy, I signed more than 30 bilateral agreements with other academies, but not 30 multi-dimensional projects and everything else. That's completely different. The third I want to say is uh, that in the contemporary world, I would say the multilateralism has failed completely. That's been shown by this pandemic. The only, what in my knowledge is going on, that's initiative of Leopoldina, nothing else. Everyone has closed in the national borders and that's a big problem. Everyone, everyone in the world has closed just in the borders. In Europe too, every country, in the world, every country. And that shows that really multilateralism has failed today. If we, for example, go to statistics, we would find the most cooperation and the most paper, scientific papers in any disciplines are in medicine. That's really a tremendous figure in the world. What are doing today? Multilateralism has failed completely. And uh, just me finish saying that multilateralism is highly related to technology. What many our activities, I wouldn't say all, but the most our activities, human activities, are really consequence of technology today. Even spoon with which we eat is technology. And we simply don't understand how technology is influencing our life and therefore multilateralism. Having institutions, academies on the different technological level, then the question is, is it possible between them to cooperate? Not as simple as that, no. So we have to appreciate that multilateralism is a really very hard question. On one side, we needed to solve problems to go ahead. On the other side, especially in contemporary world these days, multilateralism has failed completely. And that has been shown by the case of uh, pandemic. So what is going to happen with multilateralism is difficult to say. Is it American multilateralism? Multilateralism. I think that most of the world doesn't like that sort of multilateralism. So it is a big question and good question for academy to carry on it, <laughs> not discussing only on economy. Economy is everything, as I said, but just discussing how can we solve problem by cooperating in multilateral way. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is the big question for Peter. Peter, may you? Well, well let, I, I agree in many ways that multilateralism has failed and we, we can look at 
um, distribution of COVID vaccines as one perfect example that every country is trying to get enough for itself. And yet the, the WHO has put in place this COVAX system for more equitable distribution that is not managing to have the resources or the, or the vaccines in order to do that. Um, so, and, and I have read one book recently that argues that the nation state is no longer fit for purpose, but that's, that's maybe another topic for another day. Um, we, we did have a series of questions planned, but I notice we are running sort of late. We've got eight minutes left, and maybe that's what Gary, I'll pass to you in a moment. I just wanted to touch on a couple of questions, maybe at, at this point. Um, just to say that academies, we, we often operate sort of bottom up and we decide what is important and try and present that to, to the multilateral organizations, the governments, the UN systems. But perhaps one thing, when we, um, we're reasonably competent at that, we're maybe not coordinated as well as we might be and we can discuss how better to coordinate. But how can we also push for a more top-down process? I, I think somebody alluded it to, to it before. How can we get on the radar of the, of the different UN organizations so that they come looking to us, asking for studies, asking for our expertise on perhaps very narrow scientific topics, but also, you know, it's been alluded to many times, the, um, the diversity of expertise that we have in our academies, including the, the social sciences, the economics. I mean, all these aspects need to be considered. So how can we put together the top down and the bottom up processes with all the diverse voices of different fields of study, the gender, the young voices and so on. So I put those on the table for the last few minutes and maybe Gary, um, you still want a word? Thank you very much, Gary. Maybe, uh, may I? Uh, ask you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Eric and Peter, and for all of the panelists for such interesting presentations. I'd like to pick up on something that Peter said just at the end, because I think that's really a, a core issue that uh, we, uh, we propose this panel because we we're for our project with the United Nations in Geneva on global leadership in the 21st century. And though we've had several discussions on this uh, in uh, our larger, our other conferences, I still felt that we still felt that we were missing some critical issues. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna put back a question to Peter actually, because I think that IAP, from what I understand of it, IAP's uh, efforts are somewhat unique uh, in, in the fact of uh, your whole model is to transcend the individual academy and bring the academies together on critical issues of concern to humanity. And you have some wonderful, magnificent projects that are going on on sustainability and all which you highlighted in our earlier conferences. Uh, but what, what I had in mind in the question is uh, you I'm taking IAP as the best example I know, uh, not that uh, there may be others that are, are, are good. I mean, at the multilateral level, we have organizations like the IPCC, the Internet, Inter, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is really a multilateral scientific institution. And then we have national academies, which do certainly cooperate with each other on certain projects or at the regional level, as Yuri was the president of ALEA, uh, European academies collaborating with each other. But what we're really interested in understanding is how can we enhance the connection between the multilateral system, meaning really the United Nations agencies, the whole 45 plus agencies of the UN, that are trying to represent our multilateral community and this tremendously rich scientific resource to a large extent, I believe, focused on the national level priorities uh, 
and to regional level priorities, but certainly contributing individually. In our case as an academy, whether, by, whether we're world or national, uh, we have been working recently uh, with, uh, on some occasions with United, Agency, United Nations agencies directly, like on this global leadership project. Uh, but we did not come to that through a mechanism of the multilateral system. We came to it through individual initiative in coming to the UN with a proposal which they found very interesting because it addressed their needs. And we were engaged to collab as a partner with them. But to what extent is there a system within the multilateral system to really incorporate the scientific community as a, a major important stakeholder? And if there is, how can it be strengthened? If there isn't, what type of system would be effective to bring science and fact-based science, evidence-based decision-making more and more into the political decisions that are taken within the, in the UN. It's that kind of recommendation that we're looking for, for our final report uh, to the UN. So whether it's in, in, any, anyone who has insight into that, or uh, uh, we, I would welcome that, uh, that feedback. Thank you. Well, let me try and answer maybe not all your questions there. It's, it's a big issue, of course. Um, there is another international science organization, the International Science Council. Um, it was known as ICSU for many years and it merged recently with the International Social Sciences Council. So now, are, now they are the International Science Council headquartered in Paris. Um, and they have the mandate from the United Nations to convene what they call the, I think it's called the major group in science and technology. And they are very present in certain UN discussions. They're involved in, in the SDGs very closely. Um, they are involved in the sort of climate change discussions they are not necessarily everywhere. They've been relatively poorly represented in WHO, for example. Um, health has not really been one of their mandates um, till now. Um, IAP is in discussions with ISC. We signed a memorandum just before the turn of the year. That we are collaborating, we're exchanging um, sort of the, the, the areas where we are working with the different UN bodies and we know where they are working with the different UN bodies and where we can have synergies and where we, we say, no, you deal with that, we'll deal with this. Uh, we don't have the capacity to do everything. Um, but our capacity in IAP is relatively small. We, we I think we punch um, obviously heavier than our weight. We, we are a secretariat of about seven people. Um, so when you consider the, the impact and the visibility we have, we think that's pretty good. ISC has a, a larger budget and I think their staff is in the order of 30 to 40. But again, it's not massive. And even just finding times between us to coordinate our activities, we, we we actually spoke yesterday, the two secretariats, and we have a plan to meet regularly through the year, um, and especially to consider engagement with the UN. So this is a mechanism. It could be stronger, and it could be, let's say, more coordinated with the UN. Often we get requests for information and feedback with very short notice, you know, three days, five days, which is not a lot of time for academics in the broadest sense, not just the academies, to, to put together a, a well thought through and peer reviewed response, if you like, because we do like our, our presentations to be peer reviewed. But that major group of ISC to the UN is potentially yeah. the, the mechanism that, that is there, but it's potentially not ideal. Let, let me stop there. Why don't you mention the voice of science? 
which is association fires Q, IIP, you know, and that world academic, the voice of science in academic mm -hmm. world. Actually, well, ISC now uses the voice of science as its little strap line. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but Gary, if you remember, I suggested IAP, that we try to join them. IAP, TWAS, and ISC are yeah. also working <coughs> on different projects together with, with <coughs> all the Science International. But they, they are more bottom up still rather than sort of top down and the, the request coming from the, the UN system. I have a final question to Gary, uh, because uh, I think we should, uh, the World Academy, also think about direct communication uh, intensified on projects or on uh, organizational uh, memorandum for understanding and, and things like this. This, uh, this might be um, fruitful for the other academies also, because we are working on disciplinarity and on implementation in the past. And uh, other academies are more reluctant in this respect. Would it be useful to have direct communication, for example, with uh, Peter's organization? Your question was, would it be useful to have what with the uh, IAP? Yeah, uh, a direct, you know, for example, the networks, the other networks, uh, uh, like uh, uh, represented uh, by Peter, uh, could we have a direct communication, not via United Nations or other institutions? So okay. we could do, have some common projects. We do, in fact, have a direct communication. We're partnering, we are a member of IAP and yeah. collaborating with IAP uh, on areas of mutual interest. Uh, my question was not so much from the perspective of WAS, though that's an important topic for us, obviously, all of us here. My point was from the point of view of the multilateral system. You know, what can we do? I mean, as a, we are legally an NGO as our uh, as I, I believe IAP must be also, uh, we're a civil society organization. Uh, and if you look at, we have about 3,000, some of them very large uh, influential organizations that are registered with ECOSOC uh, in the United Nations system. Uh, but if you see the avenues through which these 3,000 organizations, we're relatively small compared to uh, some of the big ones like Oxfam or CARE and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but if you see the, the access that the, the organizations have to influencing the UN system is, is very sporadic. Uh, yeah. It's more like a straw to, you know, draining the ocean. Uh, and uh, we, are, we have been asked to formulate recommendations for how the multilateral system can yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't so much worried. I, I mean, it's, I'm of course I'm concerned or, or interested in what we can do to strengthen our collaboration. And with IAP, I think we're doing a good job of finding partnership areas that are mutually beneficial. And we're going to be starting now. We have just started on a new project in collaboration with the UN on human security, but that's at our initiative. Uh, the UN is a beneficiary of that collaboration uh, mm. uh, in, in all. But we're looking for recommendations on what can we, the, the Secretary General is aware that the UN system is, is relatively uh, limited in the number of stakeholders that have a contributing voice in the system. Uh, they, he wants more uh, voice of civil society. He wants more voice of youth. And we're arguing there, there can be more effective mechanisms for the voice of science in all its respects. Uh, mm. And not through straws, but through real cha effective channels. And that's what I was kind of probing for. Uh, uh, any ideas that have come from other academies as to how we can do this more effectively. 
but you know, if you look at it this way, national academies were a tremendous in invention, you know, 300 years ago. Uh, the idea of bringing the scientific uh, resources of, uh, of a people together and then uh, for exchange, that was the Royal Society. And then the idea much more recently of scientific organizations collaborating with each other, which at the time of the World Academy was founded, was still, it's not that it never existed. It did exist even from the Solvay uh, uh, conferences, which uh, Tibor mentioned. But this was very periodic. Every few years, there would be a conference or something. Now the collaboration is much more frequent uh, and it's more ongoing. And we have the regional groups like ALEA uh, and we have IAP, which is much more younger, uh, but, but trying to bring academies together from all over the world. But my question was directed to Peter because that last link is the link between 143 academies and the UN system and how, and, and we know uh, it takes a great deal of uh, ingenuity and resourcefulness and, uh, and uh, persistence to forge that links because it's not there by right. It's not there by, by rule. It's not there by institutional structure. It's more uh, on an ad hoc basis. So uh, I was exactly. looking for recommendations I, I was, on that basis. I was just going uh, to finish on that. The connections we've had have been very often personal. Um, rather than institutionalized. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, may I, on this last point, mm -hmm. on the, on the top-down approach, uh, I recall in the context of the UN, 10 years ago, in uh, the process of developing the SDGs, at that time, Ban Ki-moon uh, created the focal point and the top structure. UNESCO was charged, Irina Bokova was charged at that time uh, to do the, the work. And uh, in a way, it did not materialize for, for different reasons. Um, the the uh, problem and the challenge I see is, I mentioned that many of the existing uh, big science support and advocacy was initiated by governments. And in a way, it was financed by governance or yeah. freeing up the time of some of the scientists and paying uh, their payroll uh, or uh, providing some support uh, to them. And this is a model which um, will not function in domains where governments are still not recognizing the need to move forward with big science support. So this is where in addition to government-driven processes, which are welcome, of course, there is a need to have certain supply-side processes, but what is difficult to see, the business model of paying for 10,000 scientists years, which went into the CTBT or verification system, as an example. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yeah, very good. Very good. So I think... Uh, everybody very much for the contribution and uh, I think afterwards we'll have to consider uh, to answer a kind of question which uh, Gary uh, formulated again on the level of the United Nations what can be done uh, uh, and what proposals are here uh, out of this discussion. So okay. Thank you, everybody, for participating. So, thank you very much. Again, All the best. Good luck.